The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales radio show with me, Charles Christian. We've got a big interview this week which covers everything from geeky tech and fake news to ghost hunting in Texas and the pros and cons of modern paranormal investigation gadgets. So, without further ado, let's get on with the show and the interview. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking with all-round techie and podcaster Christopher Jordan, who many of you know has been weaponizing minds with his Dudes and Beer podcasts since 2015. Chris, hello. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. And you, Charles? I am as well. Now... I spoke to you a couple of weeks ago. Well, actually, it's just before Christmas. When your, your your show aired a couple of weeks ago uh, for your show, and now you're on my show. But let's have a bit of background about you because you do the do the dudes and beers podcast, but you're also into talking sound podcasts and tech. So, give us a little background about where you came from and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Sure thing. Uh, Well, I hail from Houston, Texas originally. I now live in Austin, but uh, my whole life has been surrounded by technology, whether it was tinkering with circuits when I was a kid. uh, That kind of carried on into college when my love for theater, things like that, and tech theater kind of moved me into the realm of engineering and running sound for bands, things like that. Um, And then I began composing my own music uh it's it's just been since i was about 20 years old an all-consuming passion uh yeah. technology whether it's building computers or assembling home studios with people uh even maintaining my own home studio creating stuff uh, designing circuits for my own music yeah yeah yeah. It's uh, it's been pretty amazing, and now I I typically until the COVID world came to be, yeah, uh, was bebopping around the country uh, as a live AV technician. So yeah, like I I just play with people's expensive toys for a living. That's <laughs> that's that's what I do. Um, it really is one of those moments where if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I got you. Yes, I was just pondering that one. Yes, because obviously for a lot of writers, and I'm often speaking to writers on my show, uh, they do what they love and um, they never earn anything (laughs) all their life because you don't earn a lot of money as a writer, but they love what they're doing. Well, and there's decent money as an EV technician, but there's definitely like a loop like a cyclic loop that happens because a lot of what you do is on the 30, 45 day pay cycle, things like that. Mm, mm. So though you may have two weeks a gig, um, Hey, your bills may come up before that 30 days to pay comes about. Uh, so yeah, it can be, it can be kind of very much in the same boat where you're out doing what you love every day, but just making it by because of the way that the pay cycle comes about. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, one thing that's fascinating about modern technology and people who listen to my show know I used to be a tech journalist to earn my living is the fact so many of the boundaries have broken down. You know, you mentioned music. Well, once upon a time, music was one discipline and computing, big, large machines with spinning discs was an entirely different discipline and never the two shall meet. Whereas now digital technology is digital technology. And if you're a musician, you are going to be using digital technology either in your playing or in your recording. You know, there's this convergence going on, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's really interesting because, you know, if 
if you go back and look at a lot of the pictures, especially from uh, the early Beatles days, things like that, they were really one of the first bands other than uh, people uh, people like, oh, I almost said Pet Shop Boys, but that wasn't it. I was thinking Pet Sounds by the yeah. Beach Boys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, they were really some of the first people to hop behind the equipment themselves mm. yeah. and be the engineer. Until then, like if you look at old shots of the Beatles, like from their first album, you see the engineers in the other room and they're literally engineers, skinny white ties, short white sleeve shirts. Like they were the dudes that built the recording console. Yep. Yeah, uh, they knew how to run it because they built it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, to see them kind of pave that way on both sides of the pond to musicians being the engineer, uh, musicians taking that over. And then, as you're saying, with technology coming to the realm it has now where the world of the computer and the world of music, video, movies, it's it's one and the same. Yeah. 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 I was, I was just, just before we got on the air, uh, answering a question in a forum for somebody like, Hey, I think with my streaming needs with my show, I, I need to get a new computer. What do I need? Um, and probably about 20 years ago, I, I would have been like, man, I, I got somebody I can send you to, uh, because all I did was word processing, things like that. Now yeah. it's like, Hey, what do you need to do? I can build you the system to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's essential. Um, I edit video for a living. I make music for a living, all kinds of stuff. So if I'm down a day without a computer system, like that's, that's registers that are not ringing. <laughs> yes. Now you cover those in your talking sound podcast, don't you? Yeah, Talking Sound was, oddly enough, really the show uh, that spawned all of this. Yeah. Um, it was shortly after I'd done a short stint on broadcast again uh, with local internet broadcast and radio broadcast. Mm -hmm. um, and I enjoyed it. It was all right, but I missed my corporate AV world. Um, I missed uh, literally the hustle. Yeah, uh, there's there's something when you're self-employed and you're waking up and you're making things happen and you're shaking hands and you're landing gigs. Yes. Um, the, it, it's the thrill of the hunt, you know, yep. uh, like walking around CES and finding your story as a technical writer. There's a thousand booths, but there's one story. Exactly. Um, yes. yes. And very much that same feeling. Uh, and, and when I left. My wife was like, well, you know, you're you're moving into this new realm of your life. You're about to turn 40. Um, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And I was like, really? I kind of <laughs> miss teaching. Yes. I was like, I, like, I used to teach kids, yeah. I, you know, junior high, high school students, stuff like that many moons ago. Uh, and I miss that. I miss those light bulb moments. I was mm -hmm. Like, but I I really think. It is time for me to reach down the same way that somebody did with me and bring up the next level of engineer. Yeah. Uh, find those little diamonds in the rough and fix the facets, yeah. polish them up and send them out in the world in a new setting, you know? Um, and it's been great over the last, I guess I'm getting ready to launch season seven with all of this CES coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, over the last seven years, it's been a really interesting journey to see the growth path of talking sound into going out and covering live events like CES, Texas Association of Broadcasters, things like that, hopping into the field and talking with manufacturers and product makers who put things out into the marketplace for people like us. Uh, broadcasters, podcasters, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that kind of really got my motor going. And that is where Dudes and Beer came from. Right. Which I have to say has one of the most fantastic names for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And and oddly enough, I think, I think quite honestly, uh, the innocuous name is what has allowed us to fly under so many radars. Yeah. As, as far as content that we have, because we, we've had some, uh, like we had members of Anonymous come on the show. 
and yeah. talk about their hack of the Minneapolis Police Department. Like uh, that that one blew my mind. Um, mm. And uh, of course, through my years of working in broadcast, working in side stream journalism, things like that. One of my jobs as a producer used to be to Google stalk people. Quite literally, my host would come out and go, I heard this guy say something on the radio yesterday. Go find him. I want him on the show. And then he'd leave the room. And I better find the dude. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thus began the Google stalk. And how do I find this guy? And how do I circumvent the handlers? Mm. Um, you know, things like that. And it was really interesting to me because a lot of my job was finding stacks of news for my host. And yeah. as someone who had worked in the news locally uh, at one point and then was working in this, it was one of those like, wow, you know, if your eyes are on the news cycle actively, there is a ton of stuff that you will never, ever, ever hear about. Mm -hmm. Because if you aren't actively reading all that news and you're just watching or listening to your news, you're li like that news cycle ends at 10 a.m. And mm -hmm. from there on, it is, it is repeat ad nauseum. Yeah. Um, so while all these other cool little stories are releasing and things like that, where it's like, yeah, scientists at CERN made matter out of light. Like that's a, that's a pretty major announcement. Yeah. How did that not make the news cycle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How yeah. is that not like breakthrough news across the globe? Like we just landed on the moon mm. type news, you know? Yeah. Um, so that became a lot of what the focus of dudes and beer was, was that conversation that was just not being had and sometimes hard, uncomfortable conversations. Um, and it's been really, really great to, curate a community on Facebook that is now self-sustaining. People have conversations, they post articles, they spur a conversation from both sides of the aisle. Um, mm -hmm. It's really fantastic. Yeah. I mean, yes, I know what you mean by the news cycle. We tend to be in the UK be a bit longer, but it is noticeable that pretty much Saturday morning, there's no new news till yeah. Monday morning. That's it. It's yeah. gone, you know, and uh, yeah. it's just recycled. We're, and We're very much the same way over here. Uh, the one thing that I love and that I always recommend to anybody is, A, um, follow a minimum of two news sources outside of your country of origin. A minimum. Mm -hmm. Minimum. Uh, follow at least three in your country, preferably of differing views, and at least two from outside. That'll give you five sources, and two of those sources are totally blind mm. and impartial to the stupidity going on here in our shores. Um, <laughs> well, we, we, like, we're doing our get, best over here. <laughs> well, sure, sure. I mean, you our, know, you our got politicians the whole are trying to be stupid as well. And oh yeah, well, I mean, they're pretty stupid the whole world over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those. Um, to to use to use the turn of phrase, y'all y'all just call a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't care. Um, very, and uh, that's one of the things that I I used to love tuning into the British House of Commons. Mm. Uh, because it really it takes me back to the days of people like Old Hickory, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who were called Old Hickory because whenever he disagreed with people in Congress, he was known to hit them with his walking stick. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> And it's so great, you know, because, yeah, you got two minutes up at the pulpit and, hey, man, if the right and good sir over here wants to stay stupid, things like that, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's so great because it really is that open, let's clean this out, out in the open, not behind closed doors situation. Yeah. Um, and your your news follows that same vibe very much where it's like, hey. Uh, say what you want about what's going on over there, but here are some facts that you may want to look at. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's it. I love reading uh, British news. That is some of my favorite coverage out there because they really, really do dig deep 
into the topics. Mm, mm. But you do need, as you were saying, to look behind the mainstream channels because they tend to pander to what they think their readers want to hear. Well, sure, and especially to the demographic of sponsors. Yes. So it's either, you know, everything is bad news or everything is good news, but they tend to miss out of the bit of the middle of sort of objective news. Reading up, I mean, you know, obvious stories are the, the pandemic, and mm. uh, there were news sources from January last year warning about it and talking about yep. it. And it took mainstream media a good couple of months to really catch on that this was something serious. And for yeah. a long time, there was this, it's not airborne, so you don't need to wear a mask. But in scientific sources, they were saying, no, it is airborne, you know, and this is how yeah. far it can travel. And that's why you have the masks. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a two-way thing, you not to give other people it and you to minimise your chance of catching it. But the sort that's of messages right. have never got through and, you know, it's then got mm -hmm. hijacked by different people with different agendas. And well, and then, and then you have people like 60 Minutes Australia doing their amazing expose on the nano lab over there and the possible origins of it and everything else and the whistleblower that came out and all kinds of stuff where it's like, wow, mm. wow. Like that was a 60 minutes piece. Yeah. But you would never, ever, ever see that 60 minutes piece here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's the same news organization. Yeah. Is yeah. what blows my mind. That's what. That's where it's like, wow, wow, um, yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. really interesting things. Whenever you start looking, and really looking at stuff like that, and be willing to just look at it, leave it for what it is, let things take you where they do. Don't be swayed by opinion. Just filter facts, and that's mm. it. Um, and yeah, we've really, really gotten a long way away from that, um, that Edward R. Murrow yeah. mentality of, I'm going to give you the facts and you can formulate your own opinion. Yeah. Uh, and that's really a lot of what dudes and beer was, you know, um, this great country was founded by a bunch of dudes sitting in a bar <laughs> they disagreed on a lot of things politically, religiously, but you know what they all agreed on? We don't want that. Hmm. Yeah. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, and less than 20% of people took place in 20% uh, of the populace, less than that of the United States took active part in the American revolution hmm. yet still, um, because of that cohesive mentality of people and that drive to accomplish something, they were able to do it. Yeah. So that's kind of my goal is to get people to just looking at facts. Let's just passionately look at points of datum. Yeah. Cause that's all they are is a point of datum. Put it in a, put it like a feather in your hat, walk on down the road. And when you need to look at the feathers, look at all of them. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's been a fun road, and that's been going, well, we just finished uh, episode 305. That is good. The other night. That. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That is a lot. Because, um, I mean, one of the things I find with where you start heading into what we'd broadly call the paranormal, which is everything from things that go bump in the night to UFOs and Bigfoot and everything else, is that the world does appear to be split between the total sceptics who just poo-poo everything and say, no, pseudoscience doesn't exist, and what I'd call the Kool-Aid drinkers who, whatever it is, you know, oh that, you know, look at that photograph. Look at look at those orbs. Those those, those yeah. are spirits. No, that's that's dust, or that's the effect of the flare from the flash on your digital yeah. camera. Yeah. And there's not many who try to go down the middle route and say, well, that's 
sounds like a load of rubbish, but on the other hand, yes. this thing here sounds vaguely credible. You know, there seems well, to be a rejection of, if you like, objective investigation and evidence. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, um, like I, I used to do some spirit investigation back in the day. I all kind of EVP stuff, things like that. Um, and, and here's, here's my take, at least on a lot of mm -hmm. the modern ghost phenomena shows, the paranormal shows, things like that, where you're walking around with, uh, temperature readers yeah. and things like that. Um, a, most of the time, if you're, if, if you're using a, a laser thermometer, uh, you are measuring the surface on the other side of the room, not the air around you. That's not how that works. Um, <laughs> yeah. number two, I got a real issue with the whole EVP on a digital yeah. device because the whole concept behind the EVP to begin with the electronic voice phenomena is that the, the ghost is able to manipulate the weak magnetic field mm -hmm. of the record head of a tape recorder. Um, not that they're able to manipulate yeah. The algorithm of ones and zeros that is the assumption of the actual sound going on in the room. Because yeah. <laughs> that's what a digital recording is doing. Yeah. It's using a microphone to pick yeah. up a yeah. digital assumption of what it actually hears. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's like phenomenal, phenomenologically yeah. a difference there in how those things work um and how they would operate so to and and granted you yeah. know people could get down to the electrolyte condenser point you know and be like oh there's a magnet in there so that's what they're eh, i guess i got a problem with the ones and zeros um because yeah it was really supposed yeah. to be a manipulation of the magnetic field around yes. a tape um and around that celluloid and then yeah you got the issue with yeah. everything being something. And I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Um, there is no way if you are out shooting eight hours of video a week for a one hour episode that you're going to catch something every week. It ain't going to happen, man. <laughs> like you would be written up in scientific journals if that was the case, you would have at that point repeatable evidence. Yeah. If you did, you yeah. would have you would have a methodology that gives you a guaranteed yeah. result every time, despite the observer. That's science, and it, it can't happen. Mm -hmm. um, I am not yeah. not a believer in the paranormal. Um, paranormal is exactly that. It is things that are outside of the norm. You know. Um, and there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. I've, I've had my own ghost experiences. I've, I've definitely had, uh, my own experiences with entities, that sort. Um, but am I a believer that every time you take a picture in a dark room, that that's an orb? No, no, because I work with cameras. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Yeah, and you know it's a, it's exactly the same that old-fashioned analog film cameras they capture everything on the film, whereas with a digital camera you've got the same thing again. It's the software that is yeah. filling in the pixels and well, and I I just had the I mean I'm going to get uber geeky on you here and throw it back really hardcore tech. I just had the conversation with somebody in a nerd group the other day that was dogging on the new uh, 4K 25th anniversary release of From Dust Till Dawn. Mm -hmm. And he was like, what do you mean you're making it 4K? That's just an up conversion. And I was like, no, no, it's not. And here's why. 35 millimeter film naturally holds just as much data as 4K. The only difference is our optical quality at the time was not able to pull out every nuance of every pixel. Yeah. <laughs> so technically, that 30 millimeter frame was already 4K. Yeah. 
we just were not able to process all of the image. So if they 4K render out that 35 millimeter footage, it is to the resolution of exactly what that director saw and wanted it to be to begin with. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was it was one of those at the end of it. I was like, and once again, there's a reason why LPs have made a comeback. <laughs> yes. Because analog is better. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that was oh um, Neil Young's thing, wasn't it? Why he was yeah trying at one stage to push his own standard for digital playback because he felt yeah. that... Uh, the uh, MP3 file just wasn't good enough. Yeah, well, it, it, and granted, it is a lossy codec um, because it takes that digital assumption and assumes even more. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that uh, that's what a compression does. Yeah, uh, is is basically skip every other byte, something like that, um, and tell it you see this byte, you see that byte. Um, remember what was in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, um, granted, yeah, if you go through and there, there are certain ears that can hear it, Charles. Yeah. Um, not every, if not every ear, if I a bead a 441 wave file, mm-hmm. which is CD quality. Yeah. And then played you a 320 kilobyte per second. Um, or megabit per second uh, MP3 that you would be able to hear the difference. Uh, that's mastering engineer level. Yeah. You know, where it's like that, that's your job all day long. Yeah. Um, and, and even then, some of those people ain't going to really hear the difference. Uh, but when you start getting into 4K realms, when you start getting into the new high definition, uh, surround sound work. Um, yeah, there is, there is definitely a difference between flat codec, MP3, that kind of stuff. Mm. Mm. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll move on from this cause we may just sure. be getting a little bit too techy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I said maybe, I was going to get nerdy. Oh, maybe only you and my engineer who puts the show together will be able to understand some of that conversation. No, but to go back to, the ghost hunting TV series and the yeah. likes. What I mean, what seems to be an issue, and also with these organised ghost hunting tours that are very popular, or certainly were popular before the lockdown, is that you've got a commercial pressure. You know, if you you you've yeah. got a you've got a show to fill every week, so you can't come back and say. We, we spent an entire week in a haunted castle and saw nothing. It was cold and damp and miserable. And yeah. if you've got a load of people who've paid money to come on your walk around, um, you know, a Nevada, haunted Nevada ghost town or something or mm-hmm. a stately home in England or whatever, and they see nothing, well, they're not going to be that happy. So you've got to, if you like, make it more of a circus and lots of gadgets going beep and lots of other things in the background they all add to it and of course once you've got a lot of people in a group together you get a certain different dynamic and somebody goes what was that and somebody else yeah i thought i heard it as well and there's a sort of collective shiver that goes through it all through everybody yeah and you've got something and you know everyone goes away happy at the end of it but i say if you just did it as true to form, most of the time, nobody would see or experience anything, but you've got the commercial pressure there to, to deliver. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where you get into, uh, kind of murky waters a little bit. Like one of my favorite places to visit in America is Salem. Mm-hmm. Love that town. Like I love that town. Um, I lived in New England for many, many years in Portland, Maine, and it was all of an hour or so down the road. Uh, and yeah, it was a regular visit for me. And I went on a couple ghost tours, you know, I always, whenever people went for their first time, um, I'd always take them on one, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, I mean, you're not going to see anything, but you're walking around and seeing historic sites that 
you know, you may not realize we're something historic. Hmm. So pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it eventually got to the point where like, uh, for a few bucks extra, you could like get a, a you know, get an EMF reader hmm. and stuff like that to carry with you and that kind of thing. And it's like, okay, okay, hold on. <laughs> do you, do you actually know how to interpret said EMF meter? <laughs> Does that EMF, e EMF meter have actual readings on it? Yeah. Can you zero it out? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, things like that where it's like, ah. Um, and I'm, I'm, hey, you know, I'll, I'll go to magic, like magic land and enjoy magicians all night long and not, you know, I, I will not ruin people's magical experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to bring this up in the mixed group, but hey, afterward, whenever we're having a pint at the pub, yeah, you're damn right. I'm going to bring it up with my friends. Like, do you see that? Horse yeah. Shit? Pardon my language. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. It's all right. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It, it is one of those that is absolutely um, a lot of it becomes hustle at mm -hmm. some point. And it reminds me a lot of uh, the American mentalist movement. Is the spirit the spiritualist the spirit, and the medium? Yeah, the things, spiritualist, yes. the medium movement yeah. that uh, Harry Houdini spent the better part of the last half of his life actively debunking. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know when when you start looking at that kind of stuff and seeing the fact that yeah we're coming up on a hundred years, it's uh, like it it's not rocket math. The world moves in cycles. Society moves in cycles. Uh, mentalities move in cycles. Uh, and yeah, we're starting to see a rebirth of a lot of this thinking. Hmm. Um, and oddly enough, we're also starting to see a rebirth of a lot of the cultish thinking that was going on right up around the same time. Mm hmm where you started seeing a lot of uh, small, fragmented cults around America, things like that, very much the same thing now. Um, and it's just strange to see that, like, even right now with COVID, that 100-year cycle. Like, yeah. this is a once-in-a-hundred-year virus, Yeah, you know? And uh, it's, just, it's just strange, man. Strange to see all of that and to see just this loop of time happening and really this almost obsession with the paranormal again. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it ra raises the same issues and, you know, the, 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 the TV was well, certainly in the UK, um, both on TV and uh, people who are organizing private ghost hunts, they have a medium or a psychic with them. And that's, you know, how it you just said about the EMF reader, how are you going to zero the psychic to make sure his, he or her is um, totally objective and just not making it up? They, they're in the same position. If they, if they just go along and say, nope, nobody's there, nobody's trying to communicate, well, they're going to get dropped and... Oh, absolutely. You know, we'll go for somebody who will deliver the goods. Eventually. And, and uh, you know... Um the the i i have a different view about bringing in people like psychics and that kind of stuff into that experience uh because if if you want to go and take some passive readings walk around with meters put up some infrared cameras put up some thermal cameras things like that get ambient readings as far as what's going on cool um the second you start trying to address spirits mm -hmm. that you are not aware of, mm -hmm. that's dangerous ground. Yeah. Um, like, you better bring somebody real with you and not a psychic. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's my opinion. Uh, I, there is still, even though I'm much more spiritual than I am religious these days, there is still a couple of things like, yeah, man, you don't want to get start getting involved with necromancy. You don't want to start getting involved with trying to communicate with the other side. Cause if you do not know what you are communicating with, mm. it could be something else in the guise of something very, very friendly. Uh, and the example I give people all the time is captain. Howdy. That Tell is us more. I, I don't know. Captain. Howdy. 
Captain Howdy was the name of the spirit that the character Reagan was talking with through the Ouija board in The Exorcist. Right. Um, it's my friend, Captain Howdy. <laughs> um, so yeah, she was just tinkering around and having fun and playing and things like that. Um, but something through the guise of Captain Howdy came in and because she invited it much, much like anybody who's read about vampires knows, <laughs> keep the window closed, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Don't open the window when the vampire asks you to let him in. Yep. Yep. Because at that point you have invited it yep. in. Um, and very much the same thing. When you are going around, are you here? Speak to us. Talk to us. Um, you are inviting it in. Mm. And you're setting up, uh, at least for me, uh, you're setting up for some pretty dangerous things mm. life-wise. Uh, you could get all kinds of fun things attached to you that maybe you don't want attached to you, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, yeah. and, and, and that's something that for me, like I spent my first year in college as a Roman Catholic seminarian. Right. Uh, and that, that was one of the big problems that I still have with the church right now is, is, uh, not talking about the true presence of evil. Like if you're going to hold this thing, um, you really need to hold it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you shouldn't softball pitch it to people cause it's apparently not a softball topic. Yeah. You know? Uh, so yeah, it is, uh, I believe a very real threat out there. Um, and at the, at the very least, uh, enough people trying to do something um, comes about into that m magical world of like air Gregor, things like that, where literally the mentality of people um, focusing their energy on one thing makes something manifest. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, kind of comes from the old uh, Jewish mystic tradition, almost of the golem. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really strange. I know. I know. Whenever uh, the movie Nightmare on Elm Street came out, yeah, Wes Wes Craven, uh, right up around the same time, the Night Stalker murders were happening, mm -hmm. and he actively believed because it, uh, there's a great documentary about just the phenomen the phenomenology of Nightmare on Elm Street, and he was like, here he was like. To hear him talk about it is amazing because he's like, I think um, not necessarily that we infected this guy's brain, but that everybody accepting this character and getting behind this character may have kind of caused a spirit to be out there mm -hmm. in an old Japanese sense, things like that. And uh, that is what took over the Night Stalker. And it's strange to hear him talk about things like Nightmare on Elm Street, where he made this movie. The movie is about um, this murdering child rapist <laughs> yeah. who some parents kill. Yeah. And then within a year, he's on like Oprah Winfrey, things like that. There are kids on the Oprah Winfrey show dressed up as Freddy Krueger. <laughs> like how, how <laughs> the character is a murdering child rapist and you're going to dress your child up as him <laughs> that. And like when he saw that, he was like, Oh my God. Yeah. Like, like, wow. People are totally blinded. Cause you know, by that point, uh, number two, number three had come out. They'd mm. gotten a little campy in some of their stuff, yeah. but it was one of those like, how are parents allowing their nine-year-old children yeah. to be taken over by something like this? And, and like it, it did a number on him. Yeah. It did a number on him for a little while. Yeah. You know? Uh, and I imagine so, because yeah, like you've, you've caused this phenomenology to happen now. Yeah. And the question is, are we by default 
causing a lot of phenomenology in our world. Well, I mean, there's obviously the fact that you get people who believe they are possessed or believe they are following something. There was a serial killer whose name escapes me, but he was obsessed with Pazuzu, who's the yeah. demon in... Um, the Exorcist. The Exorcist. It was another gruesome, um, murdering, rapist type uh, yeah. story. But when the police finally found him, his whole basement was just covered in Pazuzu stuff. And, and he had Pazuzu tattoos all over the place. And he genuinely believed he was possessed by Pazuzu. Mm. It doesn't actually matter whether, if you like, Pazuzu as a demon spirit actually exists or not. But if somebody believes they are, it exists and they are possessed by it, then that's still as bad. Well, precisely. And, you know, it's interesting because there, before the point of possession comes the point of obsession. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, which... Uh, if, especially if you go back and read a lot of the work of uh, Father Malachi Martin, uh, who was world famous exorcist. A lot of exorcism movies are based on some of his cases loosely. Yeah. Um, and he was, of course, like the exorcist for the Pope. He was a, one of the only Jesuits like relieved of his duties by the Pope um, and told, just go live your life, man. Uh, <laughs> you've served enough, you fought enough. Um, but to hear him talk about the point of obsession and how close so many people in the world are, uh, and it, it really is like you were saying, um, it's not necessarily, and I, I'm not going to say that Pazuzu doesn't exist. I don't know. I may get up there and find out it's Krishna mm. beats me, man. Uh, <laughs> but Somebody becomes so obsessed with the ideology mm. that they become possessed of mind. Mm. And it really is that that obsession is a point of surrender. That obsession is a point where you have given over your will to allow something else or the love of something else to control you. Um yeah. Which can lead to possession, yeah, uh, because you've now opened that door, and of course that goes into drug addiction, heavy drug use, alcoholism, all kinds of stuff. Mm. You know, um, psychologically, when when you're talking about that point of obsession, where somebody has chosen to allow something else to control their life. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, and it, it you know at what point does your obsession become possession mm. is the question. And like you were saying, this case with this serial killer, uh, um, who would obviously become to the point of being possessed of mind that he was the demon Pazuzu. Yeah. And I mean, a similar example would be the slender man and the fact God, yes. Two kids were going to kill one of their schoolmates as a sort of sacrifice to the Slender Man. But, you know, he, he, he was a cartoon creation from a, you know, an online competition. Um, yeah. A long line thing on... Um, Creepypasta. Creepypasta. And you, I, I had I had spaghetti in my work. My <laughs> mind. I knew it was something Wait, of that nature. Was it, the, was it the Pastafarians that came up with him? <laughs> Uh, was it the spaghetti westerns? I don't know. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yes, on Creepypasta, I mean, that was the same. He doesn't exist, but for the people who yeah. believe in him, he does exist. And, you know, you, as you were saying about the rise of various cults, and we won't get yeah. into politics because that's not the no, no, no. area, Absolutely but the not. same thing happens with there, that you get people becoming single-issue fanatics and everything well, they see is Even, either an affirmation of their beliefs or clearly the powers that be trying to squash their beliefs, but there's no yeah. objectivity. They Again, they're obsessed. 
Well, and and to, to it, just to show one more point of that before we leave the topic of politics, the hilarious one to me that happened before our previous president was elected and about a year ago, there was a group of witches here in the United States who said that they were gathering together as a coven to cast yep. uh, to cast the spell of harm against Donald Trump. Yeah. And I was like, wow, OK, you want to know what's happening right now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you remember that threefold rule of do no harm? Yep. Like a whole bunch of you just tried to move the universe to hurt this guy. And you wonder where all this turmoil is coming from. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that is witchcraft one hundred and one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, man, you can watch Sabrina and figure that out. <laughs> yes, but that that one just blew my mind. I was like, wow, it almost blew my mind as much as the guy that uh, used to be my next to my house here in Austin that had a sign that said "Good Karma, twenty five cents." <laughs> and I almost pulled over one day and went. Buddy, we need to teach you about the karmic principle. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not how karma works at all. <laughs> but cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Do your thing. <laughs> now, you mentioned you'd had some um, paranormal, supernatural experiences. I seen a ghost or something or experience of that nature. Sure, yeah. I've, uh, well, like I said, I worked with the group Lone Star Spirits many, many years ago uh, that did investigations around uh, the Texas area, things like that, yeah. and definitely saw some strange things occur um, that were fully unexplainable. There was there was one house that we were in in Houston, the Ale House. Um, before it was torn down, it was one of the oldest standing structures in the city of Houston. Uh, went back to like the days of the Galveston hurricane, things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, story was there was a sea captain that owned the place before he died. Um, he still lived in the place as well as the spirit of a lady that used to be a waitress there. And um, there was a great, great picture hanging in the, in the establishment of the lady uh, on the stairway which was fantastic. Um, we went in to do an investigation one night and uh, cut off main power, all that kind of stuff, just to make sure that nothing was interfering. Mm -hmm. um, started up meters, had had a typical situation where we op cracked open the new batteries and things didn't work. Yeah. Um, all kinds of stuff. So... Uh, we started placing recorders and meters around and just quietly sitting. Um, and out of nowhere, in a place with zero power on in it, the 10 key register turned on and rang up a sale. Mm -hmm. And the drawer opened. And it was like, hmm. Okay. That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, same thing with uh, having pennies thrown at us in, in the place. Stuff like that. Uh, there was a, one place that we went to um, where it actually has a little bit of fame to it uh, was Indian Shores mm -hmm. out uh, in the east side of Houston in Crosby um, is a uh, the Newport subdivision. Yeah. And that is, that is actively the location that the movie Poltergeist is based on. Right. And that was some pretty spooky experience being out there on that property. Um, definitely one of those where things just did not sit well, things did not sit right. Um, the whole night that we were there. So Yeah. There, there were quite a few experiences that I had um, along those lines. And I, I've even had my own experience of, I guess it would be a shadow person from, uh, from, a, from a bout of sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm. 
And that was one of the most scary experiences of my life. Uh, that was absolutely frightening. Um, I, I remember waking up, uh, not being able to move at all and having this large shadow creature, um, slowly coming onto my bed, uh, while I couldn't move. It was, it was one of the most frightening experiences of my life. Uh, so yeah, there have been numerous things like that that have happened. So yes, I am fully a believer in the paranormal. Mm -hmm. Um, but I am also a full on skeptic. Mm -hmm. I trust my meters. Um, and I trust science. So there, there are things in the world that, uh, you know, you either take on faith or you don't. Yeah. That's how I view it. Uh, and a lot of the reason why I have people on my show, like Sev talk, who says that she has had alien experiences and has had marks left on her body, things like that. Um, Terry Loveless or Lovelace, mm -hmm. who is coming on soon to talk about his incident at devil's den. Mm hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people may say they're crazy. Um, I myself entered the seminary because I felt the full presence of God mm -hmm. and felt a call to do so. So, uh, I guess I'm crazy too, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I cannot quantify the experiences that I have had that I consider divine in my life. I cannot. I can't quantify them to anybody. Yeah. But I had them. Yeah. That's fascinating, that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Even it, even in the world of science now, it has come to the point of paranormal. All of, all of two years ago, uh, the Pentagon released in Jane's Defense Weekly that they had uh, drones that could be controlled via brainwaves. Hmm. Like a, a soldier could have a device in his helmet that would be able to control up to three drones by a distance. Yep. All kinds of things like that. Things that were literally the realm of science fiction are now fact. Yeah. So uh, it would not surprise me at all for us to start finding some quantifiable in the next few years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh. I hold specifically that we will we will probably see some pretty major disclosure within the next year. Um, just just with the announcements that have been made already in in the UFO community, uh, in the UFO world, I know that with the signing of the first COVID relief stuff or the second COVID relief package, that apparently put a hundred and eighty day countdown on declassification. Yeah. So there was a huge dump. I'm still going through uh, documents that were given to the Black Vault. Uh, that was, a, and I don't know if you have access to that or not. I can absolutely share a link with you. Yes, please um, do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, most definitely. It's a vast amount of information. And it's one of those that, like, you open up PDF number one and it's two pages and three quarters of it's black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, on the 23rd of May, Dr. So-and-so, uh, Dr. Blank, said blank, <laughs> blank, 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 blank. Yes. <laughs> it's like, what? Why? Why? At that point. <laughs> so much disclosure. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, with the, with the recent announcement of, quote, possible off-world craft, um, just the the amazing leaps that have been made in the world of fusion. Mm -hmm. Um, like was it Korea that just lit their artificial sun? Yeah. And, and had a successful test run. So yeah. And I mean, geez, we show the video from skunk works all the time. Whenever we have Mike Turber on where they're talking about, um, fusion big enough to fit in an aircraft. Yeah you know, fusion reactor. And this was like five years ago, generation three. And whenever the camera pans out, like it's like a 10 by 10 space that they're in with the fusion reactor. 
And they're like, well, we'll be able to scale this down in size pretty rapidly. You know, so, yeah, could it be the fact that the things that were seen on the Nimitz uh, were possibly unmanned drones Mm -hmm. being tested? Because the, you know, it's strange. Uh, You've got all these um, carriers and airplanes out on maneuvers. You I'm sure that there are one or two that are armed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wouldn't you think that the typical protocol would be to at least send in a wingman? Yeah. You know, like, hey, follow it, but we're going to send an armed guy with you just in case. He's going to come catch up with you, you know? Um, it was just strange the way that whole thing was handled, where it was like, follow and observe. Yeah. And then whenever they got back to the naval carrier, Air Force personnel boarded the naval carrier and took the computers, but took took the black boxes from the naval aircraft, yeah. Air Force people. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, whoa, whoa, what are what are they a doing on a naval aircraft? Um, yeah. B taking the footage from them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was just a really really strange the way all this stuff came out. Um, the way it's just kind of a hey, there it is. Hey, we're cool with it. Um, even whenever Luis Elizondo put it out to begin with, it was not labeled for public declassification. Yeah. Like, they didn't admit that that footage was real for a year. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think we may be on the verge of some really cool announcements coming up. Yes, indeed. And I think, Chris, that is a perfect spot to end on. All right. Just opening up what could be laying out for us in the future. And I say it's 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 worked very nicely, the segue from technology at the beginning to the paranormal to technology and paranormal. Whenever you read people like Isaac Asimov and hear the concept of what was once magic eventually becomes technology and... And what is technology to some would be magic to others. So thank you so much for having me, Charles. It was absolutely fantastic. Christopher Jordan, thank you very much. We'll no doubt speak again. But until we do, thank you. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, folklore, and the paranormal. You can keep in touch with us online at www.urbanfantasist.com, by email to urbanfantasist at icloud.com, and on Twitter at urbanfantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Goodbye.